All right. So we're going to continue on the discussion from last time. I see a little mistake here. This should say 27. In, of um, energy resources and environment. And last time we were discussing carbonaceous fuels after we had some kind of general discussion. And today we're talking about, I'll we'll start with some carbon sequestration. Um, let's just talk about how realistic that is as a hedge against continuing energy demands globally and the continued availability of fossil fuels at a level which is damaging to the atmosphere. And then we'll talk about some other non-carbon fuels. I'm just going to go through these really quickly. Um, and the last of which, nuclear, I'm only going to touch on today because we will talk about nuclear energy next time in a lot more detail. And then I want to end up with talking about some other considerations, um, socioeconomic, especially about um, greenhouse burden and the economics of reducing the so the global load on the atmosphere. So from a carbon sequestration perspective, this is something you hear a lot about, something people have been talking about for a long time. I personally have the opinion it's largely panacea um, and unrealistic when brought to scale in terms of controlling CO2 in the atmosphere. It's at best something that would allow us to keep using fossil fuels and to not increase CO2 in the atmosphere as much as it's currently increasing. But let's go through some of this. And it's, it's a big topic. There's a lot of different aspects to what is meant by carbon sequestration. But this is just a snapshot of where the carbon loading to the atmosphere is currently happening. These are 2017 numbers, by the way. You can go to this place if you want to see it. So you can see here that there's essentially several countries that are the top five. And there's, you know, some other countries that are highlighted because they're big enough to um, be measured, and then there's sort of the rest of the world. And these top five account for something almost 60% of the net carbon. So, you know, that's really the place to look for um, controlling carbon loading. This is another way of looking at things. This is instead of the total net amount, this is the per capita, meaning normalized by the population. And again, you'll see the top five, which are these four, and this one put a big amount, just so you know, the average global production of CO2 per person averaged over the entire population of planets about 4.7. So this is something like 10 times that for that one country. So, and you know, thought, where's the US? Well, we're ninth on the list. So on a per capita basis, we're not as bad as this seems uh, over here, but so is China. Um, forgotten where they are on this list. Um, if they're even on, I don't know if they're even on this plot. So because our population is so large, even though they produce a lot, <clears throat> per capita, they don't produce a lot. Okay, so this is just a little bit of stats about this. This is the sort of average um, production of CO2 emission. This, this obviously was lower because of the pandemic that year, but you can sort of see 4.7, 4.78. That's kind of our, our typical value um, over the last five or six years. And if you go to this website and you look, they have a plot and you can see that before that, it was a little bit lower. It's been increasing, um, although it's possible the pandemic has suppressed the increase. And if you look at the top five countries on this, you say, oh, the population is only 19 million, but since they admit six times the global mean on average, the average across all of them, even though cutter is much higher, that's more like a population of 115 million or, or more than a tenth of a billion. So compared to, you know, of global citizens, the U.S. produces half as much as this per person. We're more like three, but um, because we have a much bigger population of the world, we're, um, compared to the world, we're like one-seventh, um, is basically the average of something like a billion citizens. So lots of different ways to think about this. Standard of living is certainly a part of it. Total energy consumption is different than carbon loading. And so countries that are making efforts, and we'll talk about this as we go on, to improve their carbon loading without um, changing their energy utilization or without having to lower it are making more progress than others. So carbon sequestration is the taking of carbon and storing it in different reservoirs either at the source or by pulling it out of the atmosphere. This is a plot showing us the typical reservoir where we can see carbon. These are log scale, these are in gigatons. 
Remember, 10 gigatons per year was a sort of year 2000 loading factor of carbon that if we're lucky, we can get back to just that value for the next couple of decades. We're beyond that now. We're not up to 100, but we're certainly in this range here. And this is, again, uh, log scale of the characteristic storage time. These are like residence times. And so you can see, for instance, people talk about, oh, let's grow a bunch of trees and make leaf litter. And that, that sits down here, right? Carbon, it goes into leaves, stays about 10 years. And um, we can store somewhere between 10 and 100 gigatons. <clears throat> we get to woody biomass, the woody parts of trees, a little bit higher. Soil carbon, a little bit higher still. We're still talking about a fairly small amount of carbon. If we want to reverse the sort of nearly 200 years of industrial revolution value from the start of the industrial revolution until like the year um, 1990 or so, which is about six gigatons per year, that's six times 200, that's already 120 if you want to pull all that out. And then, you know, since then we've been adding a lot more. <clears throat> we need things at the value, the capacities of like a thousand, at least to suck all the carbon out that we put in the atmosphere, which is it's just difficult for other reasons. Um, but just that's to give you an idea. So soil carbon, we've got um, ocean acidification, meaning putting carbon dioxide into the ocean. Th this is an enhanced oil recovery method that basically takes CO2 rich fluids and sticks them into the ground to pull out uh, extra oil. And it's got longer residence time, so it doesn't hold much carbon. These are the big ones. So injecting underground deep aquifers, but adding stuff to the ocean, but keeping the ocean neutral, meaning don't allow it to acidify, and rock sequestration, making mineral carbon. All those things are difficult from a space perspective, but this is just like another description of carbon sequestration in general. There are sort of three main popular variations on this. One of them is called biological sequestration, where we're somehow using the biosphere. It could be the marine biosphere, it could be the terrestrial biosphere, but we're trying to put carbon back into <clears throat> biological tissue. And that's okay, but we're talking about relatively small amounts of carbon and relatively short time scale. Then there are schemes that put carbon into the marine biosphere combined with sequestration, meaning formation of organic matter that falls to the seabed and is preserved as sediments. Um, and we'll talk about what this means, but usually this requires some kind of over fertilization. Okay, well, sorry if, if you remember what I just said when on the recording, but I'm not going back. Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, there, these, think about, we have periods of time in, in Earth's history called ocean anoxic events where there were big areas of the ocean that had very large carbon fluxes from the surface ocean to the deep ocean and seabed. And that, as we've talked about during the semester, um, produces conditions where there's a lot of respiration, consumption of oxygen, and either low oxygen consumption or, or I mean, low oxygen conditions or even hypoxia. And over vast areas of the seabed, this fundamentally changes benthic ecology. So this is something that people talk about doing, but um, it's likely to be slow and it's likely to have these kinds of impacts. And then there's this sort of capture of CO2 from the source. And the, the implication with both of these is that we're just pulling it out of the atmosphere, like sort of slowly lowering the dispersion of two. That's not actually a pretty hard prospect to do just because we know what the timescales are associated with CO2 exchange from the atmosphere to various reservoirs. We've talked about that in the past couple of uh, lectures. These are sort of decadal to centennial timescales. So this could help, but it's certainly not going to make a dramatic impact, you know, um, before maybe, you know, late in the century. So if you kept the CO2 at the source, like, you know, at coal burning plants and other places where CO2 is being generated and do something with it, 
then at least you're not allowing it to go into the atmosphere in the first place to energetically be more favorable and cost productive. And so this CO2 can go into various places. That's the CO2 that could go into the ocean or the ground or the rock mineral sequestration because in a much higher concentration and therefore able to be utilized for these uh, more efficient storage methods. So this is kind of what biological sequestration looks like. We have to remember that when we put carbon dioxide into plant matter, there's a certain amount of cycle to this decomposition, respiration. Um, you know, one of the things that people talk about a lot, and they've set up test forests in places to look at how this works is, what is the time scale associated with this? And when we fertilize trees and make them grow much more quickly, we also apparently, for many varieties of trees, turn over the rate at which they produce leaf litter so that the carbon doesn't manage to get into the soil, much of it, much of it decomposes, goes back into the atmosphere on timescales of a decade or less. Some of that organic matter can perhaps be transformed into what we call soil organic carbon, which has a variable and complicated timescales associated with it. I had a graphic about soil organic carbon earlier in the semester. It can potentially have timescales of retention of something like a century but not in all cases. It depends a lot on the conditions um, in the soil as well as um, climate factors. So this is kind of what ocean fertilization looks like. So this is a picture of what's called the biological pump, right? Where photosynthesis is taking CO2 plus nutrients from water and making organic matter in a photosome. That stuff is sinking down. And whether we're talking about a lake or the oceans, much of that organic matter that falls out of this zone is respired on its way down. Remember, in the oceans, we get about 100 meters depth where photosynthesis happens at an average depth in the oceans of over four kilometers. There's plenty of time for particles to sink down and be respired. So a lot of the CO2 is put back into seawater. This is why we see slightly um, lower pHs in the deep ocean than in the high ocean. Uh, uh, shallow. However, some of that carbon can be buried on the seabed. Currently, naturally, the way the oceans are configured, there are very few places where there's a net flux of carbon from uh, the water column all the way to the seabed. They tend to be basins close to shore with weird characteristics of restricted flow. There are the basins off of Southern California. There's something called the Cariaco Basin, which is um, off of Venezuela and the Caribbean Sea. These are places where there's steep topography and it's restricting the refreshing, the replenishing of seawater so we can send and consume oxygen and then preserve organic matter. There have been times in the geological past where we've done a lot of this and preserved a lot of, of organic matter on um, the seafloor or uh, also on land in Carboniferous. But this process as it naturally works currently sort of um, for the most part retransforms all this organic matter. But the idea with sequestration, okay, is to sort of bypass this, what's called remineralization, which is just respiration, which takes that organic matter and makes it back into CO2, which then, of course, through the process of upwelling, managed to get back into, into the photo zone, take that and have more detritus buried on the seabed. So that's kind of, you know, depicted here. Make more happen here. This is long, fairly long term storage if you can do it at scale. And um, whereas this, this time scale is maybe something like 100 years, and we couple that with the circulation time scale for the oceans of you know, maybe 1,000 years, we're not talking about a super long-term ability to store carbon in the ocean. The real potential is if we can store it on a seabed. There is the problem of benthic ecology. <clears throat> and that's, I think, something that's really difficult to get around. Um, so there's also putting carbon in the soil. So this is just another slide sort of highlighting the main points. We've looked at, this is just the carbon cycle scale we looked at a couple of lectures ago, showing you that there's basically talking twice as much carbon in surface soils as there is in the surface ocean. So at first blush, it would seem like a pretty good reservoir. Um, it's the same thing, do fertilization on land and prevent the carbon being re-respired to go back into the ocean and it's like somehow being locked up um, in the soil materials. The problem is that even the soils themselves, unlike the 
organic matter marine sediments. The soils themselves can turn over carbon relatively quickly. So it doesn't have a millions of year time scale. It has a sort of decadal to centennial time scale. And um, you know, there's the, the cycle of photosensitive respiration on the land surface. And the fact that there's much less water involved or sort of mediate things like uh, pH and nutrient con content means that um, we have a lot quicker um, and more reactive processes that can transform organic matter. So it's probably not a particularly good storage area. And that's not even counting things like the potential for erosion, um, et cetera. So then we get to the real carbon sequestration things that could potentially mitigate future increases. And these are all these sort of point of source grabbing CO2 where they're being produced and then kind of putting them into the ground in one way or another. And there are various things like putting them into depleted oil and gas wells, taking unminable coal beds, which can absorb a fair amount of CO2. There are deep sea line aquifers, which we would never use for drinking water, where we can inject them. All of these things have questions about, well, how, what's the integrity of them? You know, is, can we stick CO2 in there and it's going to stay? Maybe. It's a maybe. Then we have these pumping into the deep sea. This has been very popular, but there's some real fundamental problems with the chemistry and the sort of mineralogy of making CO2 into um, the right form at the pressure and temperature. So we'll look at the phase diagram for that. There are even places that take um, the CO2 and make carbonated beverages out of it. Of course, this has like zero resonance time, right? It's just going to go right back into the atmosphere. So it doesn't actually either account for much CO2 or do anything to mitigate it, but I just thought I would mention it because you know everyone's thinking about the possibilities. And then there's the mineral sequestration. So the main issues with mineral sequestration, which are making carbonate minerals, calcium carbonate, calcium magnesium carbonate, are the amount of energy it takes. At present, it takes more energy to make this happen, and we're getting our energy primarily from fossil fuels. So we're putting more carbon to the atmosphere than we're pulling out by doing this. But there's also a question of the space. We will go through this. If you have to have a significant effect on the CO2 in the atmosphere, you have to make such a large quantity of carbonate mineral that we don't have places on the planet to store all this stuff. We'll be making mountains of it. And we'd be requiring um, very large mines to take rock out of the earth to make this stuff for. So, you know, residence time, you, you saw with the, um, uh, that plot I showed you a few slides ago. This one has the longest residence time. This one um, is probably the next longest, plus minus depends on, on, on some of these aspects. They, it all probably overlaps with this in a very short residence. So this is just an infographic from a Scientific American article showing you some of the ideas involved here. So both on land and offshore, and you've got sort of the unminable coal beds, um, old uh, salt domes are places that have been usually mined to have their oil and gas removed. Um, and they have a salt cap on them and they tend to be very dry and not allow water in. So the potential place to store things. There are these deep aquifer, as is correctly shown, these things often do intersect into the ocean. So there's a question about how long will stuff actually stay in this aquifer before it reaches the sea. Um, depleted oil and gas reserves. And then there's these sort of different uh, things. Everything over here in the oceans is essentially unrealistic. Anyone who has ever bought dry ice and dropped it in water knows that it doesn't sink to the bottom, right? It floats and bubbles as it emits CO2. And um, so that's, there's a problem with atrophic density reasons, which you could probably overcome. This one here is even more complicated. Um, it has carbon, carbon oxide lake is basically the way of saying very high CO2 concentration dissolved in water, supposedly staying very dense and near the bottom of the ocean and not having any impact on, on density ecology. But as we'll see in a second from the phase diagram, this is not what CO2 does at the pressures and temperatures in the deep ocean. So this is just a picture of an, uh, uh, graphic, I guess, of an actual carbon sequestration um, project in Canada to the Canadian government um, image showing you sort of you've got um, oil recovery. So this is a place where CO2 has been concentrated and is being used to sort of push into the ground, lower the viscosity of oil. That's what enhanced oil recovery is, is sort of getting those last few drops of oil out. 
So the CO2 sort of stays in the ground. This is a, you know, a bed that's beneath some sort of cap rock that they've drilled into. They're injecting the CO2 with water. They're pulling out the um, produced oil and um, they're injecting additional CO2 to take up the sort of additional pressure. And that collectively, this is a way of storing CO2. And it, it potentially is, you know, I've never seen a really reliable estimate of how much, what is the storage potential? Like how, what if we, how many oil wells in what countries and how, over how many years could we put, putting CO2 down there? And what's the likelihood that it's going to stay there relative to rare geological events like earthquakes or other disruptions to groundwater flow? Um, so, and, you know, this is something that has some potential, but it's still fairly uncertain as to how much carbon you could actually put there. When we come to pumping it into the sea, the things that we have to think about are the chemical form, the resonance times, including the overturning rates of the oceans, which at their longest are um, about 1,500 years. And that's if you're in the North Pacific. So if you're in the Atlantic Ocean or the Indian Ocean, the uh, resonance times are a lot shorter. We have to consider the pH effects. Um, when we put CO2 in water, it makes carbonic acid, it lowers the pH significantly. We're already dealing with minute shifts in, you know, ocean pH from ocean acidification, and this would only enhance that. And then you also have to, you know, understand what kind of biosphere effects you're having, whether they're in the upper water column or the mid water column, all the things that um, we've talked about before, like calcification processes of organisms, Need to be considered. And when we're talking about these deep carbon reservoirs, which um, would store car much more carbon in much higher quantities, and we're talking about really low pHs, and just like that ocean fertilization, there's going to be benthic seabed impacts of that. <clears throat> so the first thing to look at is a phase diagram. This is a phase diagram of temperature versus pressure for just CO2. So obviously, we have to think about the solubility of CO2 in water, CO solubility of CO2 in salt water. Um, because that's going to be part of determining how much carbon we can hold. But there's some other kind of critical considerations, such as this is um, zero degrees, so freezing at um, atmospheric pressure. Um, and, you know, this is pressure in atmospheres, okay? And so um, one, ten, hundred, thousand, ten thousand. If conditions found in the deep ocean, CO2 is not a gas, it's a liquid. And so at very high pressures, it turns into a solid. And so we need to consider the form in which we would be injecting CO2 and transporting CO2 and what happens to it once it's down there. One of the complications is that CO2 undergoes a reaction with water to make a hydrate, just like the methane hydrate that we talked about. So this is a phase diagram for CO2 with water. There's a much narrower range of temperature and pressure here, I put on the atmospheres, these pressures are in megapascals. And the important line to follow is the green line. So this is the blue line is for pure CO2, just like on the last diagram, uh, between gas and liquid. And you can see that as we're kind of going up uh, or down, down in pressure, shallower in the ocean, we, we have gas transformed to liquid if it weren't for the fact that we also at around a temperature between you know, four and eight degrees C, we convert the gas this way um, into a hydrate. Okay, and this hydrate looks just like a methane hydrate, but it's um, more stable at lower pressure and higher temperature. So this is actually a tube, a down-facing tube on the front of an ROV um, from Mbari, Monterey Bay, the Aquarium Research Institute. Um, they do experiments just off the shore in the Monterey Canyon. And it, while they were trying to do some injection experiments of CO2 in the water, they actually formed the ice hydrate in their tube. And so uh, I don't know why they looked at the face diagram beforehand, but they didn't. Uh, but they did put this video out there, and it's pretty instructive to go and look. And what you find is that you would have to come up with a way to overcome this the physics, such as using hot water, again, which requires energy to even be able to get the CO2 to inject and not form uh, these ice, ice, these hydrates. Okay, and this is an experiment that was done off the Big Island um, nearly 20 years ago now, and you can go to the, the website of it. And this is looking at 
sort of depth in the ocean and a distance. And these are in meters. And I realize the graphic isn't very high quality. And it's um, color scale for pH. So I put one scale here. It's got the same scale everywhere, but this is 5.9, which is obviously acidic. This is 7.9, which is slightly basic. Remember, you know, typical seawater is around eight. In some places it's a little bit higher, some places a little bit lower. But I think you can see that, you know, after five minutes of injection of some CO2 into the ocean, there's um, some very low pHs right around the injection point, and that just sort of spreads out. And, you know, this is a small experiment, but this is over hundreds of meters in a half an hour. We're affecting the pH over a pretty large area of ocean. And I think, you know, the likelihood that we're affecting the planktonic organisms that live here, and at this depth, there are obviously zooplankton, there's no photosynthesis going on, as well as the larger uh, fauna is, is pretty likely. And so you can see, well, you know, all those things will just swim out of the way. And it's, possible, but if you do this at scale where you're putting enough CO2 into the oceans to really have an effect on the atmosphere, then you're not just affecting a couple of places, you're affecting the deep ocean in a lot of areas. <clears throat> so now let's talk about mineral sequestration. And this is the gist of what it looks like. You're basically taking rock, silicate rock, and here they're showing solid waste of industry, you know, maybe uh, mining operations or something like that. <clears throat> and you're taking um, other sort of mineral material that you're pulling out of the ground, for instance, the slag at mines, and you're capturing CO2 at power plants, coal fired power plants, and you're piping it as a liquid, and you're somehow mixing them together and causing a chemical reaction, which actually does require a fair amount of energy, <clears throat> and you're making you know, calcium magnesium carbonate, either pure calcium carbonate or dolomite, which has about 10% magnesium in it. And um, it obviously depends on what uh, minerals you're starting out with, what rock contents. And then the fate of this stuff is either to be stored, disposal, whatever that means, or you know, maybe something could be reused in construction of some kind or another. So in theory, this sounds pretty you know, doable. It's got a really long resonance time for the carbon. The main issues are this reaction is really slow. You know, it happens on land as part of the rock cycle and it affects the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere on 100 million year time scales. So you got to really accelerate this carbonation process. And at this stage, that's mostly done by raising the temperature, which means using energy. Um, so somehow you got to reduce the energy penalty of doing this, because if you're using more energy to make the carbon uh, go into the rock, and therefore producing more carbon than you're pulling out of the atmosphere, there's really no point. Uh, and you have to find a space to dispose of all this stuff. And that's really the primary issue that gets me. Whenever you hear people talking about um, rock sequestration, it's useful to do some calculations. So this is one of the largest mines in the world. Okay? It's called the Bingham Canyon Copper Mine. And it's been operating for something like 90 years. And it's got the stats of how much um, if carbon is, I mean, carbon, how much rock is pulled out every year. And I've just convert, done some conversion there. It's basically 90 years worth of rock, meaning the entire lifetime of this thing, could sequester the annual output of almost a thousand average coal, coal fired plants. So we have way more than a thousand coal fired plants on the planet. And it, it took us 90 years to dig this hole. So we'd have to dig a lot of holes. You can think of it another year way, which you say, well, what, the, how much rock would pull out of this mine in a year and how much carbon could that? That can sequester about 10 years of output from a single average coal fire plant. So if you integrate up to the number of coal fire plants that we have currently on the planet, you need a very large number of these mines worth of rock. So we're gonna have to dig a bunch of holes on the ground, make a bunch of rock. One of the other interesting things about these carbonate minerals is that they're less dense than the silicate rock that we took them from. So the stuff takes up more space than the rock we use to react it with. <clears throat> People have talked about taking carbon and injecting it into the ground and causing these reactions to happen in the subsurface. And again, they haven't thought about the fact that once we scale that up, we're making less dense rock from more dense rock. We're going to have the potential for shallow earthquakes, deformation of the land surface, and the like kind of akin to what we have with fracking if we were to start to do that kind of mineral carbonation at scale.
So this is a kind of heat map, if you will. It's a frame graph from a video. I've given you the address of the video if you want to watch it, where it shows you um, the amount of carbon per year being produced at coal-fired power plants in the year 2019. You can actually play the video and it shows you like year by year how this changes. But you can see where the hot spots are. There's the United States, there's Northern Europe, there's India, there's China, they're the main ones. And um, the gist of it is, and you can see how it's changed over time. It's been increasing. In, in fact, it's increasing rapidly since the year 20, um, 2000. I'll show you that on the next slide. But if we took the year 2019, we take all of that, it would take about 243 mines of the type, the largest mine in the world that I just showed you on the last slide to sequester this every year. Okay. That is a lot of rock sequestration. I, I personally think it's totally unrealistic. So, and this is just some interesting statistics that show you that since 2010, there have been hundreds of new coal fired plants. This is not, I mean, people think about it, it's like, oh, this is a legacy of like something that we were doing in the 60s and 70s. And surely we're smarter than that, but we're not because as countries, as we've talked about already, want to increase their um, energy that they have available for economic development and so forth. They go for the fast and easy fix, which is pretty much the coal-fired plants. So most of the new coal-fired plants are in Asia. And you can see the relative amount of change, 121% increase in number of coal-fired plants between 2010 and 2018 in India, 54% in China. So these are places that are accelerating the rate of coal-fired plant production, therefore the rate of CO2 loading in the atmosphere. And here's the rest of Asia, also at 50%. So even if we were to keep pace with these 2019 values and somehow build 243 of these mines every year to sequester all that carbon, we still have to deal with the fact that um, there's this increase. So in my opinion, Sequestering can help reduce the rate of CO2 loading into the atmosphere, but it's not going to reverse it. It's probably a bad thing in the sense that it will be an excuse for countries to keep using fossil fuel longer than they should, right? It's not ever going to be able to um, hold most of the CO2. So it's really kind of a temporary fix, a bridging technology, if you will. And in the year 2000, when we still had a chance to kind of limit the amount of CO2 going to the atmosphere, it made sense to promote carbon um, sequestration. But now here we are nearly a quarter century later, where we're still loading CO2 to the atmosphere, even at an accelerated rate. It seems kind of silly to be talking about sequestering as a way of mitigating carbon loading in the atmosphere and still loading carbon in the atmosphere. So the other strategies, which I think are much better, involve increasing efficiency. We've talked about this at, um, a little bit last time that oh, there's a lot of energy that's just wasted in conversion from one form to another and transfer and storage that we can gain a lot more. If we could just make everything twice as energy efficient for the same amount of energy, we could produce half as much carbon. That's a lot more effective than this, both in terms of cost and in terms of space. So the question is, is you know, how, how much can you get from efficiency improvements? And that's really variable um, around the world. And we'll come back to that near the end. So I just want to hit on some non-carbonaceous fuels. One of them is solar. And we know that solar has a lot of benefits of the renewable energy. Um, it's the kind of main considerations with solar, again, is when you make it up to scale, it takes a fair amount of space to collect it. And the collectors, currently, the ones that are high efficiency, require minerals um, that are not equally distributed on the planet, especially rare earth minerals for which um, China has most of the world's um, reserves. We have some as well in the United States, but not nearly as much. Now, they, people have been working on all sorts of enhanced technologies using organic polymers and all sorts of things. You know, solar as a means of generating small amounts of energy for your handheld device or whatever, yes. Solar being able to produce most of the world's power demands, um, you know, replacing hydrocarbon cars, um, sources, probably not. One of the important things is that, you know, you, you make a direct current from solar. So you basically have to store, you have to couple solar with a battery and then 
um, pull that out through an inverter so that you feel like power your house. And again, people at the level of an individual house where for someone can generate their own power, yes, that's potentially the case in some parts of the world, like here, where this is relatively sunny most of the year. Wind power is another thing. We talked a little bit about it before. You're basically taking uh, wind and uh, spinning a turbine, generating kinetic energy, running um, you know, a turbine through a magnetic field, inducing a current, taking that current. So again, it makes direct currents. It requires storage. The wind isn't always blowing in most places. Some of you may be aware that there was a proposal in Hawaii to set up a wind farm significant quantity, not the sort of small stuff that's up down the North Shore. And, you know, just a little bit over here um, in West Maui. But um, basically, the residents of Bolokai said, we don't want it. Um, as Molokai tends to do with a lot of things. So this was the proposed route of um, undersea cables. And these red areas are the places where the resources are. Any of you who spent any time here in Western Molokai or Northern Lanai know that it's really windy there. And so you could set up big turbines. They're not populated areas. So they wouldn't be particularly unsightly. I think this would perhaps be more unsightly because um, that's, you know, um, right where Kapalui is. Um, this technology, this isn't too complicated. The seabed isn't that deep. It's, it goes about uh, 1,000 meters deep between here and here. But the idea was to generate a grid to provide more resilience to Hawaii, use this natural resource. And I think the sort of main complaint that came out of the entire Maori County was, oh, all those kids on Hawaii, Oahu are using all the power. Why should we have to generate it? You know, it would have brought a lot of jobs. I don't think it would have been on a sliding scale, all, all of that ugly or negative um, or expensive. But um, in any event, it's, it's, it's been shelved now for well over a decade. All of the, the planning was done, you know, surveying. Our school was actually involved in a lot of the surveying. Um, but as with a lot of um, things, you know, Molokai is one of these islands that wants to kind of keep the country country. And so that hasn't really happened. Geothermal is another interesting one. We're basically using the natural heat gradient in the ground. And one of the places where we find geothermal a lot are places where they have a higher heat gradient than normal because they're near volcanoes. So, or previously volcanic areas. This includes Iceland, New Zealand, Japan, California. These are places where we have um, really effective geothermal. And what you're doing with geothermal is you're taking so room temperature water and you're pumping it down in the ground and you're heating it up, okay? And then you're bringing that back up to the surface and you're exchanging it through a series sort of intermingled pipes. You're taking that hot water and you're heating other hot water. Other types of geothermal take the water straight out of the ground and bring it up and then transfer the heat into fresh water. The problem with the geothermal fluids themselves is they're really rich in minerals. And when you lower them in temperature gradient, they tend to precipitate a lot of minerals and they clog the pipes. But there are places that have solved this. And so these are some pictures I took uh, one of the times I was in Iceland, you know, of uh, just a typical power plant. If you're in Iceland, all your hot water is free. In every town, small little village has a geothermally heated swimming pool and jacuzzis, which they call pot, pot pots. Uh, this is basically just a map of one of the larger power plants, Sparksengi, um, which is in South Iceland. Reykjavik is just off the map over here. They distribute hot water and they distribute electricity. So they take the hot water and they run steam turbines and make electricity that way. And they generate hot water for people. And if it weren't for the fact that these guys also have a lot of hydroelectric, they just have a lot of flowing water in Iceland. Um, this would be, it, it, it's run economically viably um, and it could be generating even more of their electricity as it could in a lot of places like here in Hawaii. The reason it isn't done in Hawaii, these are just some random pictures um, from a guy named um, Gretar Everson, who used to be a grad student in this department many years ago before, before my time. Um, but he, after he graduated here, he worked for the Icelandic Energy Company for many years. I think he just retired. Uh, these are some pictures that, that he sent me. Um, you know, it's not the prettiest thing. This steam smells, it's got a very strong sulfur odor to it. Um, and some people argue that in Iceland, they've got a little bit too close to the active volcanoes. They've had a couple of cases where they've actually had molten magma come up um, when they're drilling a new well. So it's, uh, 
but like I say, they have the technology, they're doing this, they're doing this in Japan, they do this in New Zealand. So there are places that do it. We could be doing it here in Hawaii. Um, there was an assessment of all the geothermal resources in all the islands. Obviously, the big island has the best resources because it's closest to the young volcanism. There's significant resources on Maui. There are even resources on this island. But um, during the, the phases where people are talking about the development of this, which was again sort of like late 80s, early 90s, through the 90s, um, there was, first off, the main um, place where this happens is in Puno, so like the main marijuana growing region. There's a lot of like people who live off the grid down there. So there was a lot of reluctance. But there was also the idea that they didn't really need the power on the big island. So it was to generate the power and transport it up here, which was again going to cause a lot of undersea cables. The Sierra Club got involved because um, they were going to put transmission lines to sort of low land, uh, low elevation forested areas of the big island. They were going to lose some low level elevation tropical forests, which we don't have that much of left in Hawaii. And then, you know, um, there was a sort of made up Hawaiian um, idea that you don't want to drill in the pellet, it would be an offense. Um, and so it's never really taken off. There is this Puna Geothermal Venture, it's a test venture that um, is on the Big Island. In fact, our main plant was um, in risk of being inundated with lava in the 2018 um, eruption. And that's like kind of a risky, the way they do it, they, they don't use water to do that heat exchange, they use a very flammable organic solvent. Um, and so there, there are definitely some, some potential problems with the way that venture is doing things, but in terms of the resource and the potential, we could certainly be doing it here. Okay, so other um, process, hydroelectric, I think most people are familiar with it, right? You make a, a dam, it can be a big dam, you know, like Hoover Dam, or it could be a smaller thing, I'll show you a picture of a small one in Iceland. You're basically storing water, flowing it down a gradient, spinning a turbine, and again, generating electricity. It's pretty clean, um, the power that you get off of it. And these power plants can last like 100 years, but they take up space. So this is an example of a, a hydroelectric plant in central Iceland, where this is an artificial lake. It's produced, it's filled with glacial runoff, and the water is funneled through this canal, and the sort of turbines are here. So here's your, your um, pressure drop, and the water's flowing through, and then you know, coming out the other side. And yes, you have impacted a certain area. This is um, a different one, another one in another part of the country. But they generate so much power from this in Iceland that they sell their power to Europe. They've been able to put pipe or elect electric transmission cables, and even with the current technology where they lose a lot of the electricity, they, um, they still make money. Electricity costs almost nothing in Iceland. And in fact, perhaps considered a bad thing is, is that they put aluminum smelting plants in Iceland. Aluminum smelting is something that requires a lot of energy. It's a pretty dirty process as well. But each part of Iceland is sort of four quadrants has an aluminum smelting refining um, plant because they have so much extra uh, electricity. So they import this uh, aluminum oxide minerals and then they make aluminum from them and then ship that back out. This is sort of hydroelectric on steroids. It's the Three Gorges Dam in China, the largest dam ever built. Something like 1.3 million people were displaced during the building of this thing. Uh, 13 cities, 140 towns, 1,300 villages were displaced. It formed an enormous reservoir that's more than 600 kilometers long. It's, you know, when this was happening, again, which was around the turn of the century, there was a, like a lot of outrage about um, cultural sites being lost and people being displaced and sort of, um, you know, um, ethnic decisions about, or decisions made by the government about which ethnicities were going to be moved and which ones weren't by the placement of the dam. It does generate an awful lot of electricity and but it takes up a huge amount of space. So this is that's one kind of hydroelectric. This is kind of the, another kind of hydroelectric. Finally, I just wanted to mention uh, fuel cells. So fuel cells, which are come are many very this technology has come a long way. And the main point about fuel cells is that they're usually making electricity with an oxidation reduction reaction, taking hydrogen and making it into hydrogen ions releasing fuel. It's like a battery, a fuel cell, except whereas a battery releases energy 
you know, from um, the anode. Um, this one here takes a fuel and the fuel is converted by electrical exchange and releases energy um, itself in the presence of an anode and a cathode. And you can see here, there's um, a whole bunch of different types of fuel cells. There are ones that are uh, large, take up a lot of space, and that run at high temperature and low temperature. We'll see on the next slide. Um, and they, um, some of them per kilogram can store a lot of energy. Some of them can store a little bit less energy. Um, this is just a table comparing some of the things like, you know, the electrolytes, the operating temperature, where what is carrying the charge and solution. Remember that hydrogen is the fuel in most of these things. Um, so um, you can see here, 80 degrees Celsius, you know, bo boiling is 100. So this is hot, but you know, you're not going to hold it in your hand, but it's not that hot. But then we're getting up to this, this is like 1,000 degrees C, right? That's like uh, molten magma temperature. Uh, even these molten carbonate ones, these generate a lot of energy. But th this would be something that you'd be using in an industrial power plant, not like in your cell phone or something like that. Um, but they do require these rare metals that are hard to come by um, and they're expensive to generate. And so again, whether you can do this at scale or not, this is really good for certain applications where you're limited to your ability to do other things. But I don't think they're going to provide the sort of world of energy needs anytime soon. This is kind of another overview slide um, from a paper from a few years ago, kind of showing you, again, some different operating temperatures, some really hot ones, some really cool ones. The fuel that's involved in almost all cases is hydrogen. In one case here is uh, methanol instead. And um, um, what they're sort of made out of, some of them are ceramics, some of them uh, have uh, you know, other caustic solutions in them, and, um, you know, just sort of the general amount of power you can get off of them. So there's a wide range of technologies, and it's a field that's definitely improving. This is just like another infographic, kind of showing you um, how some of these can be made in a really thin film modalities, so really slim, the kinds that might, you know, be in a watch or a phone or something like that. And they're just like little mini batteries, they're light mini batteries, where um, you know there's nano and the cathode, and well, actually, I guess the cathode, and that's the anode of this diagram. But you're basically using charge to draw things to one of those two places and affecting this oxidation reaction or taking hydrogen and making it into uh, energy in water. So, you know, it's, it's a thing, it's getting better all the time. For these higher temperature plants, um, this is maybe, I don't know, maybe this technology is coming someday. This was sort of a a Scientific American article uh, a couple of decades ago to July 99. Uh, the idea of like, oh yeah, you know, if you're in a cold place, you can use one of these high temperature things and you can even pipe the heat off and pipe this heat around your house and, um, you know, heat your house with it and run a fuel cell and be self-contained. And yeah, maybe, right? But um, for most of the world, you're just gonna be generating a lot of excess heat that you're gonna have to pump into the atmosphere, which is gonna increase temperatures on the ground. So as I mentioned, we're gonna talk about nuclear power separately um, when we get into our last topic, which is environmental radioactivity. But I just wanna mention a few things about nuclear today because um, nuclear is an important source of power generation in the world. All through the sort of 70s, 80s, and 90s, when people knew the global warming was coming in the energy industry, in the carbon industry, in the fossil fuel industry, they always assumed that nuclear would replace everything else. And the only reason it hasn't is a combination of sort of fear, cost, laziness. It's actually a very efficient um, method of power generation. This is the Diablo Canyon uh, power plant in California, which has subsequently been decommissioned because it was placed in a really bad place, placed uh, on an earthquake fault. And one of the things you see about power plants, nuclear power plants, they're always really close to a source of water because they need water to keep them cool. So again, nuclear power plants, they run just like many other power plants. You're using the nuclear fuel, the heat, water, to make steam, to run a turbine, and then put electricity out onto the power grid. So other than the fact that the fuel is radioactive, which uh, you know has, has many potential hazards associated with it, 
The rest of the power generation is pretty traditional. It's pretty much the same as a coal-fired power plant. So people talk about taking nuclear power from the kind of current modality where there's a couple of big power plants in some places, and many countries have been decommissioning the power plants that they originally built in the 70s and up into the 80s. There's been very little new development. One of the leading companies in the world, General Electric, is a US company. They're still making reactors, and there's some countries that are still moving forward with the technology. Most of the technology that we see in place in a lot of parts of the world, it's old technology that's not particularly safe. It's not managed particularly well. And, you know, stuff has a lifetime. And after 50 years, it's pretty much time to replace it. And that's where the costs start to come in when you have to decommission. And so in addition to the traditional nuclear power plant, there are various other modalities that might have smaller self-contained units that can generate electricity for an industrial complex. Think about electricity that is generated on nuclear subs, or um, nuclear aircraft carriers is done safely. Does it sound like there's an exposure risk to the people that are on um, those vessels? And they do it, and it's the militaries do it, but there's costs and vigilance and people have to want to do it. There's even possibility of doing micro reactors for sort of isolated communities that are you know, far, far from major electrical generating capabilities and ways of doing it. So this is a historical plot from you know decades ago that we've we've looked at this last time too but in a slightly different version of it starting in the 70s this goes to 2050 and you know we've got coal and continuing along which as we've talked about is probably what will actually happen we got oil petering out it got oil pretty much gone by the end of this decade gas gone by 2020 right so we know that's not realistic because they didn't know about unconventional recovery methods They've got solar growing, but you can see here that the bulk of the energy production for the planet is nuclear. And there's really no reason why this logic is bad, right? This is actually a pretty good logic. It's fuel, it's widely available, it's dispersed, it can be done safely, but there have been accidents, which is one of the reasons why people are skittish about it. But the real reason countries are skittish about it has to do with the proliferation of terrorism and the potential for stealing of these fuels. Now, this is like another diagram showing you, essentially, you can see here the temperature curve and the CO2 emissions curve. This is sort of recognizing all the way back, you know, in the 80s. That, yeah, global warming is coming and we totally cannot continue using carbon-based fuel. The atmospheric CO2 concentration is going to go up. We've got to pull the emissions down to keep the temperature change from happening. And, and the, the problem really with the acceleration of energy demands on the planet since the start of this century and um, carbon loading in the atmosphere is because we haven't followed this diagram, in my opinion. If we had done this and you know made enhancements here and with other renewables as well, and pulled these things down like they're shown here, then we would have a lot less carbon in our atmosphere. <clears throat> so this is you know kind of an assessment of the, the key issues. The sort of security and health risks, right? And this depends heavily on the type of fuel and the type of reactor. And some of the biggest um, risks have been with older style reactors or really poor decision making, like in the case of um, uh, the Viteco in Japan with the, the Fukushima uh, disaster. We'll talk about that coming up. What do we do with reactor waste, right? Which can be very reactive and needs a place for storage and the storage situation in the US is very, very bad. Um, decommissioning of aging reactors. And so in some countries like former Soviet Union and other parts of the, um, the Eastern Bloc that are now independent, but were part of, they have pretty old reactors and um, not very safe technology, but also even if you stop using them, you still got a lot of irradiated material, you got to do something with that. So it's legacy materials. And then there's sort of incidental radioactive materials formed from neutron irrigation. And we'll talk about this more um, next time. This stuff is close to the reactor core. But this is really something, all of these issues can be addressed with money. It's just a question of people being kind of reluctant to spend the money it, because public acceptance of nuclear is kind of iffy. Um, I'm not, again, I'm not exactly sure why in terms of the space requirements and a sort of relative ugliness factor is probably better than wind or solar farms and can certainly generate a lot more power at a lot cheaper cost 
um, currently using the existing technology. But in any event, it's just sort of a combination of factors and the accidents haven't helped. So I just want to point out that there are two things when we see nuclear, there's nuclear fission, that's a standard nuclear power, atom splitting, things breaking apart and releasing energy. Also make new radioactive materials, which is part of the risks and the hazards, but there are adequate controls and there are new kinds of fuels that allow fission to go in controlled ways so we don't have runaway meltdowns, uh, which are like the equivalent of miniature bombs. There's also nuclear fusion, just putting stuff together, right? That's like um, the thing that powers our sun. The pressure and temperature requirements are very high. You're essentially trying to combine hydrogen atoms together and releasing energy. And there's been a lot of research in doing this in a way that you get more energy out of it than you put in. At this stage, we're still at the stage where we're putting more energy in to make fusion happen in small little research reactors and we're getting back out of it. So it's not really economically viable, but I think it has a great potential. I mean, eventually we could be using hydrogen, which we can extract from the water in the ocean and um, we're generating helium from it. And it, you know, if this can be worked out, that's, that would probably be you know, the benefit for the future. Um, so there's just a little bit of stats about nuclear fission, the traditional method, right? So about 10% of worldwide electricity production is not trivial. It's about one third of all the, I don't say non-carbon, they call it low carbon because there is some um, incidental carbon associated with this, but about, about one third of the sort of non-carbonaceous electricity produced globally is produced that way. Um, and, you know, um, various people estimate, this was from an article just a couple of years ago from the UN, that nuclear power generation demand is going to increase like sixfold. I mean, there's still people that are in the know um, sort of basically say there's really no other way to quickly change the mix of fuels that we're using and still supply the energy demand without nuclear, which means we're going to need some more, right? There are some countries that 30% uh, of their electricity, these are mostly in Europe, come from that. You can see Ukraine is on here. We all know what's been happening there recently with the Russians. That, that is a hazard if you've got another country that's willing to attack your power plants um, and you know with complete disregard of safety control. There are other countries like you know Belgium and Germany have announced plans to phase out their um, nuclear power. This was in response to the Fukushima disaster. Um, which was an unfortunate disaster, but we know what the mistakes that were made there is. It seems unwise because both of these countries have switched to basically building coal-fired plants, which is just you know not helping for the CO2 situation in the atmosphere. So I just want to bring you know, to your attention a new technology, which is um, called pebble bed reactor. So in the traditional nuclear power plant, you've got basically the pure uranium. It's been enriched in 235. Sometimes um, they're, they're run in slightly different ways. And we'll talk about that next time. Um, they're very efficient, um, but they generate very concentrated wastes and they can go super critical if they're not kept controlled under, you know, with water and monitored all the time, which is essentially what's happened in every um, major nuclear accident that we've had. So in this pebble bed scenario, you kind of alleviate that by taking your nuclear fuel and dispersing it into a carbonaceous or ceramic material. It interacts with water and generates heat, but it never can get hot enough to melt down. And the waste products, the nuclear, the radioactive isotopes that are produced by fission are encased in these other materials that are embedded in them. So from a terrorist perspective, there's really no benefit to taking one of these things in trying to extract out some of the um, potentially dangerous irradiation or fission products because it's just not economically viable. And this is technology that was developed in the United States. We've never put it into place. Other countries have. Um, slowly, um, it's, it's been taking some time to, to come online, but there are some of these things, they're just sort of spheres, sort of ball-sized spheres. Some of them use uranium, some of them use thorium in them. And um, this is a particular design in Germany. It's got sort of the radioactive stuff in the middle and then a carbonaceous uh, coating. And um, this is how one of these reactors work. You're basically like a funnel of these bees 
and you're pumping them through and they have a certain, they're designed to have a certain lifetime when they're spent, they're sort of dropped out the bottom and they're basically just like any other one of these technologies they are heating war, right? So you're, you don't have the risk of them going critical. You don't have a concentrated radioactive waste. They're fairly inexpensive and you can make them at relatively small scale. So you could use them in a sort of micro reactor to major reactor type of setting. To me, I'm not really sure why um, this hasn't caught on more, but um, it's probably part of the future. This is um, a high temperature uh, you know, reactor, what it looks like. Each one of those um, sort of uh, units that you saw sitting up there across the top, and you're basically generating electricity off of it. So, I mean, there, there was a company in South Africa that was trying to develop this over the country in China company in China that was trying to do this is one in Germany. So I think it's coming, but it's it's been slow. This is technology that's like 20 years. So for the last little bit here, I just want to talk about energy future um, on, in the context of CO2, right? And so unfortunately, CO2 hasn't been on everyone's mind as the main driving force until perhaps recently. The main driving forces people have been thinking about with respect to energy production before they finally accepted the sort of carbon loading things were things like, what does it cost to generate the energy? How acceptable is it to the public from all these different uh, features? What is the environmental impact? And it includes carbon, but there are other pollutants as well. And the recognition that different societies place different values on all these things. So it's not as simple as saying, oh, the world should do this. Thing. So this is, for instance, one way to look at this. This is the amount of carbon emitted to the atmosphere and the cost of different types of fuel. And this is a diagram from about the turn of the century. Again, just kind of illustrating where we were at, showing you coal and natural gas. They're both really cheap. This one produces more carbon than this one. So you know, given a choice, you might choose that. Uh, and with carbon management, this is, I, I think, a panacea. This is from that same article, which I showed you with the dry ice sinking to the seabed, uh, saying, oh, yeah, if we can sequester carbon, that's what this means. We could lower the cost of carbon utilization to basically somewhere equivalent to wind power and still use carbon, which is, you know, cheaper and easier to develop. Um, but, and this is basically if instead you try to improve efficiency, uh, which costs more and more as you improve efficiency. Now, again, I think there's a lot of politics in here. Efficiency improvements can be done a lot less expensively for some scenarios than this shows, but it also shows you as of the year 2000 where things like solar was. Now, that's this, this diagram would look different if it were today, but the point being that you can always make it something like this to, and look at trade-offs of things like costs and the amount of CO2 emissions. And this is one of the arguments that the fossil fuel industry has pushed on us to make it seem like fossil fuel should be part of our future. So this is a diagram showing you it's the historical use of energy since the start of the Industrial Revolution. It's been increasing. It's different for different countries. The United States is higher than others. But, um, whether you believe in using fossil fuels or not, if the rest of the world is going to be on the same trajectory of per capita energy use as us, you need to be able to follow some kind of pathway that keeps this thing increasing. As it's shown here, it's techno fantasy because we already know we can't do that with carbonaceous based fuels. And even with all of the other technologies that I just mentioned, we're probably not going to incre keep increasing in an exponential level the amount of carbon. So some other possible futures are uh, we stop using carbon and our energy use crashes and you know we go into some kind of like um, you know proto barbaric times where no one has a cell phone or you know our power consumption is a lot less. That's probably not going to happen either unless we destabilize the planet so much that um, you know, society breaks down. But then there's some other sort of um, interesting scenarios in between, such as um, putting in as much technology that's non-carbonaceous and as much uh, conservation as possible and possibly some carbon management to keep our energy production relatively high, maybe at about the current level per capita, stabilizing off, 
or something that has a sort of creatively diminishing the amount of carbon that we're using, but still our excuse me, energy that we're using, but um, you know, still maintaining our style of life. And we don't really know where we might end up falling between these two things. But the one thing we know is that we can't keep using energy the way we're using it. Um, that it's just unsustainable. <clears throat> so people talk about this, you know, you've all seen the food pyramid. This is a um, energy efficiency pyramid. And basically the point to make is that the most um, savings that we can have to keep us being able to use an amount of energy is some amount of conservation and energy efficiency. Renewable energy is a small part of this puzzle, but extractable energy that like we're currently using, whether it's nuclear or carbonaceous, has to be coupled with better efficiency and better conservation. <clears throat> Um, this is just some information about energy improvements with efficiency. So it turns out that if you look at places that are relatively progressive and relatively wealthy, um, and so this is just an example from California, for instance, these are energy efficiency improvements over you know, the decade from 1998 to 2005 for different things. These are you know, different kinds of devices. And so they've already been making improvements all along. You can see here that, for instance, dishwasher is already up here. There's really nothing left to do. There are some countries in the world where you can still get something from household appliances, but the efficiency improvements would be more at the industrial scale at this stage. Um, this is just a plot showing you where the most sustainable companies are located today. And you can see they're mostly in industrialized countries that have are, they're, they're the ones that are also generating uh, most of the carbon and using most of the energy. They've already baked in efficiency because many of them have been making these improvements over the last couple of decades. I want to um, point out this book, if you've never read it, it's a little bit old now, it came out in 2008, but it was a really forward thinking book. This is that guy, uh, Thomas Friedman is like a New York Times uh, author. And what he did was interview people in the energy industry. There's something like, I can't remember, 20, 25 chapters, and each one is with, he's interviewing the head of a power production plant or the head of a, you know, one of the big energy concerns or one of the big fossil fuels uh, companies, as well as politicians and so forth. And he sort of proposes, you know, this kind of national green philosophy uh, that is largely based on the usage of smart grid. And so, you know, people are now familiar with smart grids. At the time this book came out, they weren't. Smart grids basically distribute your power to you in the same way the internet provides information to you. And there's load factors, there's demand, supply and demand. You can design appliances so that they can ask for power when they need it. You can program them ahead of time to use power at night when there's um, more of it available. As we all know that the sort of cost of power and the um, capability and the sort of um, infrastructure to generate power is based on peak demand, right? So places that get really hot in the summer, they have to, um, where everyone's got their air cool on, they have to build more power generation capability than they need for most of the year just to, to do that. And with smart grid technology, what you basically do is have two-way communication across the lines. It allows people, for instance, to have their own solar units and to put power back into the grid but also um, devices on the grid can ask for power when they want it. You can have cars with solar panels on it that are in parking lots and are putting power back onto the grid. There's all sorts of technology there. It's a really interesting book because like I say, it's very forward thinking and there are test um, bed um, smart grids in various places and you can save a ton of power. So uh, there's just a couple more slides, but I just kind of want to point out that um, <clears throat> Basically, we have really these two competing considerations. There's sort of cost and amount of energy and carbon. And so we're really looking for you know, alternate fuels. I don't think carbon sequestration is going to be in there. Many of the non-carbon alternate fuels appear to cost more simply because the fossil fuels have been subsidized for the last century in the countries that are using them. So we have the infrastructure, the countries themselves have been putting in you know, pipelines and everything else. So it looks like it costs less. But if you in fact we're in use the cost of the environmental cleanup from spills and so forth, they aren't all that cheap. But in any event, um, one might imagine a future where the countries that can afford alternatives, even if they do appear to be more expensive, use them. And that involves a lot of non-carbon fuels. And the countries that can't that are trying to increase their energy utilization will. 
this is one plot showing you where we think energy consumption might be. This was done in 2018 to 2040. So these are various things in oil, natural gas, coal, other renewables, um, bioenergy, nuclear, solid biomass, and, and uh, hydro. So what you will see when you look quickly is that only one of these that looks bit bigger in 2040, much bigger is this one. This one looks a little bit bigger. These three don't really, the circle doesn't look that different, right? I mean, it hasn't grown as much as it could. And I think that's probably the most realistic assessment that we're going to keep using these fuels. We're not really going to curtail them. We're going to try and get more of our new power growth from these other uh, things. <clears throat> So the other things, here's kind of what they are. We've talked about them before, right? Um, some that are renewable, some that are extractable. Um, and that depends a little bit on the geography. One of the interesting things is like, we look at some of the countries that have really increased their power utilization. It's China, I know I pick on them a lot, but India, you could also list. These are countries that have really increased the number of coal-fired plants and their energy production, their energy utilization, they're using like old technology, old dirty technology that um, wealthy countries could donate to them the ability to make power at modern standards. And this is a place where you really could get uh, efficiency improvements and really impact carbon loading for less cost than you might do it in your own country. Then you also you go to the sort of impoverished countries, the places that are trying to come up on the energy utilization. And, you know, they don't, unless we're going to give them the technology, they don't have the financial resources to develop a lot of the latest, greatest stuff. And so these are the places where you probably want to focus the use of high, high quality carbon based fuels. So let them use the carbon. But to do that, we have to get off carbon, right? We have to go to the alternatives. And so, um, you know, in a global perspective, what you might say is the way that, you know, we're going to reduce the greenhouse emissions is reduce the cost of all the other things that we talked about, the renewables and the efficiency improvements and uh, conservation and um, use alternates and allow the poor countries to still continue to use carbon more so than the wealthy countries. Unfortunately, that's obviously not what happens. Um, as we all know, uh, because then you talk about economic competitiveness and people aren't thinking about the, the globe yet. Um, many of them, people are the politicians are. Trying. But this is just a list of the kinds of carbon that you might want to use. And I think this should be obvious because we've already talked about it, that natural gas is the least bad fuel, right? It generates none of the other problems, the black carbon and the sulfur uh, oxides and nitrogen oxides and uh, mercury and all these other things it does produce CO2, but all these other things, oil and coal, coal gasification, biomass burning, they produce other things as well. Plus there's more environmental impact on the planet from taking them out of the ground. So this is probably the one that we're gonna wanna focus on, including methane hydrates as we talked about last time. So I will leave it there and I'll apologize that if you go to watch this video, I think my microphone might have been off for the early stuff or whatever.